You're listening to the Technology for Mindfulness podcast, episode 75, hosted by me, Robert Plotkin. Today, I'm going to be speaking with Nadja Streeter, founder of Eyes Up Wellness. Nadja is a psychotherapist and parent coach based in Westport, Connecticut, where she works to treat problematic internet and technology use and video game addiction. You can find out more about Nadja at the Center for Internet and Technology Addiction at virtual-addiction.com. And head on over to technologyformindfulness.com for information and tips about how to be more focused, productive, creative, and happy using technology. And sign up for our email list to receive a free guide on how to find balance and manage your technology use with mindfulness. I'm extremely pleased to welcome Nadja Schreeder to the Technology for Mindfulness podcast. In the interview that you're about to hear with Nadja Streeter, you'll hear her mention that in this time of COVID-19, we might find ourselves engaging in more technology use of certain kinds than at others. Uh, you know, checking the news compulsively or playing video games or video watching to kind of zone out. You know, I found it interesting that she says that we should accept to some extent that we might engage in more use and it's not necessarily uh, harmful to do. And I'd just like to expand on that. You know, uh, very often on this podcast, on the blog and elsewhere, I talk about uh, setting limits and boundaries with technology use. And it's true during this time of, uh, of social distancing and isolation and the news changing constantly, it's going to be more challenging for all of us to strike a, a balance for us in our technology use that's healthy and accept that it might be different than in other times. For example, you might otherwise check the news once a day, and now you might have a really valid reason for checking the news multiple times a day because there's developments that might occur that are relevant to your health. And what you know, I'd suggest that we do, and I'm trying to do, is still maintain that awareness of things like checking the news uh, to make sure that we are not doing it compulsively, uh, but doing it in a way that is balanced, even if that balance now is different than it might be at another time. And the other side of things is to just be a little bit easy on yourself to know that if you are checking news, watching videos, playing games, doing other things that might be to distract you, to relieve some tension, and then you feel guilty afterwards because you engaged in what you felt was too much, just be a little bit easy on yourself in light of a recognition of how stressful uh, this time is. That maybe at another time, uh, you know, you might want to set different limits. And even if you want to set other limits now, if you find yourself exceeding your limits, it's really helpful to try again, you know, the next hour or the next day to reduce your time or maybe do something else that's healthier. But just the suggestion is to, to be a little easy on yourself and, and catch that self-judgment before it occurs. And then just be aware that this situation is going to keep changing and maybe your balance will continue to change and it probably will continue to change. Maybe it will go back to more of where it was before, but the situation is very fluid. So I hope you find this, these suggestions helpful to be aware that it might be okay, even healthy or productive to be making some more use of technology now than before, as long as you maintain that awareness of what you're doing and not engage in it mindlessly or compulsively try to use some mindfulness to catch yourself if you're being compulsive and then just be easy on yourself. You're going to hear a lot about a lot more about these topics uh, in the upcoming interview with Nadja Streeter and I hope you enjoy it. Hi Nadja and welcome to the Technology for Mindfulness podcast. Good morning. How are you Robert? I am doing well under the circumstances. Uh, and I just want to say to our listeners, what I mean by that is we're recording this on March 24th, 2020. We are in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm in Massachusetts. I think you're in New Jersey. I'm in Connecticut. In Connecticut. Okay. So 
Things are changing by the hour. This will not be posted probably until at least a month from now. We don't know what the circumstances will be when you're all watching and listening to this. So uh, we are not going to attempt to be timely, but we may talk a little bit about how the virus impacts uh, digital life and health and wellness to the extent that's relevant in the conversation. To that end, I think it's extremely ironic that the technology we've been so concerned about dis connecting us is the very technology that we're using now to remain connected. And I think that's an important point. I think people need to pay really close attention to the positive ways we've been using it. I know that people have relied on your work to help them through this period. And if we can continue to pay attention to all the positives and extract that and hopefully use technology that way in the future, that will be a silver lining that comes out of the COVID-19 pandemic. Yeah, yeah, I've really been appreciating that, particularly these one-on-one -on -one or small group direct communications, which everyone is turning to now. Uh, you know, to me, it's a great antidote to the to the isolation. And um, let's let's make sure we return to this. I'd like to make sure people first get a little bit of a flavor for for you and your work and what you do. Uh, I, I know that you, you work on helping people with uh, digital addictions, including video game addiction. Maybe you can tell people a little bit about your background, you know, how you got started with that kind of work. So uh, in about 2008, um, I was changing from the standard flip phone over to a BlackBerry. Uh, I was a, I was a stay at home mom at that point and a Blackberry seemed like something that was mostly used by people who were in finance. Um, I'm a former banker, so I could understand that and I didn't see any need for it, but my friends all started uh, using them and I resisted because I recognized that having this mobile technology would also mean that I was going to be semi enslaved by this mobile technology, I wouldn't be able to pretend I hadn't seen that email until I got home. So between 2008 and a couple of years later, I found myself um, almost forcing one of my children to get a Blackberry because she needed to check her emails in high school. That was how her coach communicated about practice. And I remember the conversation very clearly and being struck and somewhat horrified that here's something that I had just gotten, now I was requiring of my mm. children. And so it was moments like that that I watched evolve. Uh, another moment was when we went from unlimited, you know, uh, limited data, so kids were texting, and then if you went over a certain number of texts, it was 25 cents a text, so they lived in terror. <laughs> and then this beautiful thing, unlimited texting, came along, and unbeknownst to us, it would begin to create a monster. So, you know, I'm, I'm a child of a sociologist um, and another professor as well, and I'm, I'm trained to think, I think, in a certain way. So I've made these observations all along, and that is what really got me interested, and it's been a passion for me. So you were in banking. And first, I'm going to stop for a second and say that we're having a little bit of a lag in the connection. Normally, I would want to edit that out. But I'm going to ask for everyone's understanding that we are dealing with a global, <laughs> un, uh, never seen before demand on the internet right now. And we're suspecting that that's what's going on. So we both have high speed internet connections, but we are all pushing the limits of it. So I just ask for people's understanding. <laughs> Yes, please, absolutely. <laughs> so you were in banking and, and now you've switched to helping people with, with digital addiction. Talk about that. You must have been quite passionate about it to make that kind of change. Really very passionate. I mean, I, was, I did uh, have an opportunity to stay at home, as I said, and really be very interactive in my community and, and with the school system and with my children. So I was able to make observations you know, regarding their, their gaming and their, you know, technology use. So that was very helpful to be in real time with that. But as I said, it was a passion for me. And as soon as I had an opportunity to pursue it on a professional level, that is what I chose to do. So I went back to school and <clears throat> I had been a psychology major to begin with. I went back to school and got a master's degree. <clears throat> and since then, you know, I've treated people 
with, you know, who are really suffering from the day-to-day problems of this era. A lot of anxiety, a lot of depression, a lot of burnout, and a lot of it is uh, technology driven. So, you know, there are problematic technology behaviors, and then there is also, you know, real addiction. Um, The APA and the WHO can't quite agree on this, but anecdotally, I can certainly say that there are people who are struggling with it in the same way that people struggle with substances. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because I know that at least a few years ago, I I think the word addiction was somewhat controversial in relation to digital behavior. I think it's more accepted now, but I still am involved in discussions with people about the distinction between generally unhealthy uh, overuse of technology versus addiction. Maybe the distinction isn't all that important. Maybe it is. Can you speak to that? And also to what you would consider to be addictive (laughs) versus non-addictive. Right. So... I am really troubled in a way by the word addiction. And, you know, it's a, if you, anybody that you speak to now, if I describe what I do, they'll all say, oh, I probably need your help too. I'm addicted to my phone or I'm addicted to technology. And so it's really sort of uh, bastardized mm-hmm. the word uh, in the truest sense. Um, you know, traditionally addiction would meet certain criteria, like an inability to reduce engaging, uh, even though it is creating negative effects in your life, or, you know, uh, having withdrawal symptoms or tolerance building up. So uh, I prefer not to use the word addiction, but I feel pressured to use it to have people understand in the general public Mm. what it is I'm talking about when I explain what I do. I think that one doesn't have to be addicted to have uh, have problems in their homes, in their relationships, with school and work, with their productivity, um, and you can you don't have to be addicted, but that's problematic use, and it's okay. very okay. easy to fall into because we're tethered to these devices constantly now without even a choice anymore. Yeah, so that certainly is one aspect of technology use that might be somewhat like food we have to eat, right? And certain other addictions are things which if you you try, you might be able to become completely free from them as a strategy. Uh, So talk talk to us about that challenge of helping people with over technology use when it's not an option to just stop using it completely. Exactly. So... Sometimes I use, I do use food uh, as an analogy, and and I've said in the past, um, tech like you eat. Mm. So for example, you know, we we eat a slice of cake, not the whole cake. Generally look to have the nutritive portion, you know, uh, nutrition throughout our day makes most of our use nutritive. Mm. Um, Why don't you eat in bed? Well, it makes a mess, but also you tend not to sleep well if you eat in bed. Mm. So maybe you don't want to tech in bed. Now, that's a particularly challenging one because um, practicing mindfulness via technology, or I like to listen to audiobooks. It's like, I feel like I'm a child and my parents are reading me a story in bed. So I do keep my phone right next to my bed. But like with food, you know, discipline is required. you, you can't eat the whole bag of potato chips and that requires some discipline. So I think your point about food, you know, is really relevant and a, a common way to think about things now for those of us who are trying to help people find some balance and digital wellness. Hmm. What other common kinds of issues do you see or what, what are the most prominent uh, that, that you see when people come to you for help? Work-life balance is a really difficult one. Um, we've, you know, we've created a culture where, because employers can always be reaching out to their employees, we're always be expect expected to be working. We're always available to work. If you're not available to work, then the guy next to you is, and you've got to keep up. Um, One of the things we don't talk about with social media that I think is important is that it has made all of us, it has demanded every professional to not only be good at their craft, but to be good at marketing. Mm. 
So, you know, that adds a lot of hours and, and energy um, expended to every day. And that takes away from relating well with people. That creates distracted parenting. It creates distraction in your romantic relationship. So, you know, those are some of the problems that I see. I work with parents a lot who are struggling with their children's tech behavior. Sometimes, you know, I kind of break these kids into two pots. Um, kids who would ordinarily be high functioning, but then find that they're, you know, caught in the in the current drift, you know, the the riptide of uh, engaging on an electronic basis rather than a face to face basis. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the other part of kids do suffer from uh, many underlying issues, whether it's intense conflict in their home or it could be ADHD, um, you know, there, there are underlying issues that do create a predisposition, trauma in particular. And so I think of those um, young people as having, you know, they're at risk for some kind of addictive behavior at some point in their lives in any case. Mm -hmm. The challenge here is that this can come to your home. You don't have to go to a corner. You don't have to buy it from somebody. There's no needle. You don't need an ID or fake ID. And the earlier you're exposed to an addictive substance, the greater the likelihood of it being problematic later in your life. So, you know, helping people find the challenge of where this is good, how it can enhance your life, um, deciding if your child is some, you know, which pot your child falls into, treating underlying issues like trauma so that one doesn't move from one addictive behavior to another, that's really critical in my work, I find. Yeah, if I'm under, I just want to make sure I'm understanding you correctly. It sounds like you're saying there are some kids who would otherwise you know, not be likely to uh, be susceptible to an addictive behavior, but they do with tech. Well, they can with tech, or it can certainly look like it. Yeah. So, you know, it's, and again, this is a, this is a um, observation about our culture in general. So, you know, parents now, as I said, you know, everybody's got to be marketing themselves on in one way or another. Um, even just to engage in your day-to-day -day life, it requires being in front of a screen X amount of time. So, you know, mom or dad are in front of their screen, whether it's working, whether it is checking online, you know, what's the status of my bill? I want to, I want to go on a trip. I want to book in my flight. Hopefully we can still do all those things. Mm -hmm. so, so they're using technology, not recognizing the extent of their use and their kids are using it mm -hmm. sometimes really for very productive reasons. Like schools have changed so that there are many more collaborative assignments because they can, they can assign those due to technology. And we assume that everyone, uh, kids are only using it in a frivolous way, but you know, they're starting to face the same demands that we're facing. Does that make sense yeah, to you? Yeah, it does make a lot of sense. Yeah, and you, I mean, you also touched a little bit on the relationship that there can be between the parents' tech use and their kids' tech use. Whether Absolutely. by modeling the behavior, can you speak to the ways in which that can surface? I want to talk a little bit about modeling behavior because yeah. it's something that I'm really excited about. So, you know, parents and people in general are, I hear constant complaining about kids don't know how to talk to anyone anymore. They can't make a phone call. So, you know, I, I try, I, I do try to practice in a very non-judgmental way. So I point out to people well, when you need to look up the answer to something, when you want to see what your electricity bill was last month or when your payment is due or you know anything that you can do, you make a phone call, but instead you're directed to www.checkithere, please don't do that. Please <laughs> let, your hit, let your kids hear you on the phone with someone else yeah. because they, they're not only not learning to speak to one another because they're looking at technology, they're not hearing you speak to other people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Parents are speaking much less frequently. They're making many fewer phone calls. So you can't expect your kids to know how to do something if you haven't modeled it for them. Yeah. I, I also advise parents when they're working at home and they need to be working at home and they're walking around with their device in their hands, 
there's nothing wrong with saying to your child, I'm using this right now for professional purposes. Mm -hmm. And when I'm not engaging in something professional, then I'm going to put it down and we're going to interact face to face and I'm going to play a game with you. But again, by teaching them that you recognize that there is a boundary, there's a use that we are required to engage in versus, you know, you're not just playing uh Farmville on your right. phone while your child right. wants to talk to you, it's really very different. That's great. And do you work with families as a whole or with parents individually, young people individually? I work primarily with adolescents and older. Um, I've worked with people in their 60s even. So I do a lot of parent coaching because, you know, the tech era has made parenting oh, so much more difficult. Mm -hmm. um, you know, their kids are exposed to more things. There are questions about whether, whether to monitor, whether or not to monitor, what's okay. I mean, we're saturated with, you know, information and demands and, and a lot of, lot of mixed messages. So I have to help parents find that sweet spot between not, you know, helicoptering, um, but being, you know, keeping their children safe and, you know, and using technology in a healthy way and not overusing it. So a lot of parent work and a lot of family work. Yeah, that's great. And I wonder, I'm sure this could be a whole other conversation, but I'm sure it has to be challenging for parents to know what are the signs of, let's say, an amount of video game playing or video watching that's, that's too much that should raise a red flag for them. Are there any basic pointers you could provide uh, that are worthwhile? Well, really withdrawing um, not only from family because teens, you know, frequently need to separate from their parents, but withdrawing in general from, you know, mostly or all of the other activities that they had an interest mm. in. Uh, now that can be really challenging because, you know, for a lot of teens, you know, kids who like to go out and play baseball had an opportunity to do that usually as younger kids because they're, you know, can be available in your town. Once you get to high school, if you want to go out and play baseball, really difficult to go find someone to play baseball with. Yeah, you need a yeah, bunch yeah. of people. Right. So, you know, that isn't always the best bar, um, but a another bar is looking exhausted all the time, you know, mm -hmm. falling asleep, not being able to get up and go to school, uh, a decline in grades. Uh, that's probably, you know, one of the best indicators. Now, all these things don't mean that you're problematic, you know, there's a problematic uh, issue, problematic gaming going mm -hmm. on. It could be that you are being bullied at school or, you know, in your community, you're just the kid that doesn't really fit in at your school and this is, this is your social life. Mm -hmm. So I, I empathize, you know, terribly with parents. I encourage them not to become alarmed unnecessarily, but to use critical thinking skills to understand what's going on and why it might be happening. Okay, that's, that's super helpful for people. Um, I do want to ask about uh, COVID-19 and whether you're seeing any, anything uh, that's different in, in the, the people you're, you're working with as a result. I mean, I'll just say anecdotally, for myself and people I know, I'm checking the news compulsively. Uh, I know that there is a rational basis for checking it more frequently than otherwise, but I'll also acknowledge I know I am doing it more than my reason would justify. <laughs> well, I mean, what, you know, actually really, what do you base that on? You know, yeah. this, this, is un, this is unprecedented. We have yeah. never had to face this and things are changing so rapidly. I think it, that we, all, we need to give ourselves a break right now in terms of compulsively checking the news. It's really important to stay informed right now. Sure. You know, when this passes, that's the time to say, okay, I don't need to be checking the news compulsively. Perhaps doing it at the, you know, frequency that I'm engaging in can be, uh, you know, reduced and, and should be reduced because, you know, p news, news checking gives you the same dopaminergic innervation that gaming does. Like mm -hmm. you, you open your phone and you look to see, is there something there 
and you're excited when there is, and even the thought of finding something exciting gives you that, you know, dopamine surge, and that's equally satisfying. I know that I find myself sometimes really disappointed when there's nothing there. I'm, right. I'm angry. Yes. I mean, I'm real. I'm, I'm angry at this, <laughs> not because it's my slave driver, but because it's not entertaining me. Right. <laughs> So, um, you know, I, I'm fascinated by that also. I find it fascinating to notice in myself that I get that hit of something that feels positive even when the content of the news is negative. Absolutely. It's the drama. Right. You know, the drama, the drama is exciting. And yes, it is, you know, you don't, you don't know what you're going to get. And even if it's a negative thing, it is something that stimulates you. And we're craving mm -hmm. a lot of stimulation right now. Yeah. So are you seeing uh, either seeing anything else that's changed in people related to, you know, overuse or do you have any other guidance, you know, pointers for people about how to handle or uh, their digital use more in a more healthy way in, in the light of coronavirus? Well, you know, I'm, I wouldn't say something so terribly different now from what I would have said before, you know, and that is that, you know, keep, keep your life in balance. I mean, technology is, is required and, and it can be used in positive ways, but it shouldn't be the only thing you're doing all day in general. However, you know, there are people in apartment buildings that can't go downstairs and can't go take a walk outside. So, uh, you know, I would, I, my advice right now is just to really pay attention to the positive ways you're using it and the negative ways that you're using it. And we don't, you know, we don't know how long this is going to go on. So now to add that as another anxiety in your yeah. life, yeah. Uh, I wouldn't, you know, yeah. Now, I, I, for example, will say that to the extent that you can have any kind of, you know, human interaction, like I've been doing some walking sessions, with, which have been, um, you know, all kinds of surprises have come out of those. So, you know, we find a relatively remote area where we can keep the, you know, safe prescribed distance, but it really brings out, you know, other things in people and, you know, opportunity to engage in nature in a way that they wouldn't have. I find myself as a therapist, it brings out, you know, another side of me. Hmm. So, you know, nature is really important, but again, if it's available and if it's not available, then, you know, maybe your nature is watching Nat Geo or, you know, go, going into a virtual world mm -hmm. experience where you can feel like you're getting some nature. So I wouldn't say suspend all rules, but I would say really be careful about, you know, being self-aware how, what you're doing now, what it's doing for you, and understand that this is supposed to be temporary. Yeah, and I just go back to what you suggested earlier, which is really to be mindful as the situation changes. Because I, I, I'm being aware of the tendency that I might have to continue with my current habits, even when the situation hasn't changed. And the way, you know, way to do that is to keep paying attention is a way of being mindful. But we, we all have that risk that we might continue in the same mode, kind of in crisis or emergency mode, even after the crisis or emergency has subsided, right? Right. Well, we'll probably have to talk a lot about that <laughs> yeah. with the people that we engage with and even, you know, with each other. Um, you know, the other thing is because we're all going to be, you know, so heavily device oriented now or even more so than we usually are. I look at it as a great time if you haven't been practicing critical thinking you know, as an opportunity to do that. So for example, we have times in our house where people aren't using technology. I mean, unless you consider TV technology, we're, we're doing the Marvel movies catalog oh, as okay, part great. of our, uh, our isolation, which is, <laughs> you know, which is really interesting and great. I mean, if, when you, when you see, you know, the world coming together to kind of, to fight a common enemy, especially yeah, in the first yeah. one where it's World War II, you know, it's really, really inspiring. So, uh, but you know, I allow tech at the table, but not scrolling. So, if you oh, want to use your tech to uh, enhance our conversation, you know, those those are my rules because I feel like those are more realistic and sustainable. So, come to the dinner table if you want to. If you have your device with you, great. Here are the rules: 
Use it to enhance the conversation. If you're scrolling, that's a no, put it down. Um, learn who deserves a timely response. I mean, we live in a we live in a world mm. where people do deserve a timely response. Um, if you're if you're out with your family and you know mom is coming home on the train and wants to know are you still are you still at dinner or should I stop should I stop at the restaurant or go straight home? Well, if all your phones are in your you know underneath in your bag and or put away. How is she going to get an answer to that? Or someone that you're working on a project with and they need to let you know, okay, I'm done. So you can start your piece right. or have a question about my piece. So learning the skills of who needs, who deserves, you know, when, when you can delay a response and when it's appropriate and needed to give a response. Like these are great opportunities to teach that. And those are skills that I think will take people, you know, in the long run, help them use their technology in a much healthier way. That's awesome. That's really, really helpful. Thank uh, you. How can people get in touch with you, find you, find out about your work and, and learn more from you about how to be more healthy in their relationship with technology? Okay, so uh, like the shoemaker's children. <laughs> Somehow my own website has been, you know, in, in under, what is it, work in progress under for a couple of years now. Under construction for a couple of years. I, I can't get to it. Uh, you know, best way to reach me is either Nadja at GameQuitters.com or Nadja.Strider at Gmail. I did found um, Eyes Up Wellness. You can get me there, but again, under construction. I'm, I'm hoping during this period I'm going to get it uh, finished off. I'm also on Instagram and, and Strider on Twitter. And yeah, that's another also little piece of advice. I try to use... Uh, only one or two social media platforms a day. So I have my mm -hmm. Twitter days, it's like Twitter, <laughs> LinkedIn days, and I use them differently for different purposes. I have my Facebook days um, and, you know, I have my Instagram days and I try not to do all of these things in the same day. Now I am more during this period, but in general, I found myself sometimes not in the mood. Like if you pay attention, I mean, you practice a great deal of self-awareness, but if you pay attention, you realize that ugh, sometimes Twitter just makes me feel bad. And so today's not the day for that. Awesome. Really good advice. Thank you. Thanks for letting people know how to reach out to you. And thanks so much, Nadja, for being on the Technology for Mindfulness podcast. Thank you so much for having me this morning. And, and I wish you and your family uh, wellness digitally yeah. and, and also physically. You too. Thanks so much, Nadja. Thank Bye you. Bye-bye. Thanks for joining us for this Technology for Mindfulness podcast with me, Robert Plotkin, and today's guest, Nadja Streeter, a psychotherapist and specialist in internet and video game addiction. You can find out more about Nadja at the Center for Internet and Technology Addiction at virtual-addiction.com. Thanks so much for joining us for this episode of the Technology for Mindfulness podcast with me, Robert Plotkin, and today's guest, Carolyn Welch, the co-founder and chief executive officer of the Mindsight Institute and the author of The Gift of Presence, A Mindfulness Guide for Women. You can find out more about Carolyn at carolynwelch.com. That's Carolyn Welch, W-E-L-C-H.com. And I'll join you next time on the Technology for Mindfulness podcast with clinical social work therapist and expert on digital addiction, Nadja Streeter. If you liked today's episode, please subscribe to our podcast and our YouTube channel and rate and review and share the episode with your friends. We'd really appreciate it. Don't forget to also check out our blog at technologyformindfulness.com to get free and practical tips for beating digital distraction and for being more productive and focused and creative and happy with your technology. And right now, if you go to our webpage and sign up for a free mailing list, you'll receive a free guide on how to manage your technology use and achieve balance with your tech.